There's a big debate about who is God. In fact, if you ask 10 different people about God, you hear 10 different opinions. And it's not about whether you're right or I'm right or he's right or she's right. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. I think what is most pressing in today's uh, society is have you experienced God? And what's it like to experience Him? That's why in this series, Check Him Out, we're looking at three things. I would call it nothing, something, everything. Did you hear me? Nothing, something, everything. So it, it, I could tell you something that at first it looks like nothing, but really it is something that has everything to do with your future, with your happiness, with your stability, with who you are, with how you perceive the world and make a difference. We're going to talk about God. Instead of talking in a debate format, you're right, I'm right, I want you to check them out for yourself. Experience God. Check him out. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. You know what will happen? The things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory, of His grace. That is not a debate. That is not a theological dilemma. You can in your life turn your eyes upon Jesus and experience something you've never experienced before. Too many people think that it's up to us to find God. So consequently, a lot of people give up. I don't want to find God. I mean, I don't have time for God. In fact, religion is not anything that I'm inclined to. Because, see, if you think you have to find God, you're already off base. You can be very frustrated because in the Bible, in the Scriptures, we are told that a sheep got lost. Now, when Jesus told this story, he didn't say the sheep ran around until he found the shepherd. The scriptures are very clear that the shepherd left the other sheep to go find the one that was lost. So it is not we who find God. It is God who finds us. That's why I wrote a book uh, about my mentors, the people God sent into my life who, 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 who were very, 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 very patient people. Uh, who walked with me and talked with me and, and, and showed me Jesus through their own journeys. And, and, and I learned something, that God does not give up until He finds us. He's the one taking the initiative. And too many people think, well, I can never measure up. I will never be good enough. Why even try? You see, you're, you're trying to find Him again, and lost sheep can't find shepherds. It's He who wants to find us just the way we are, injured and broken and lost. And, he, and, and Jesus tells it very beautifully that the shepherd took the, the lost sheep and put him around his neck and walked him lovingly back to where the others were. Tonight's teaching is drawn from the book of Daniel, chapter 1 through 4. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament, chapters 1 through 4. This is a story of the King Nebuchadnezzar of one of the great, great empires of history, the Babylonian Empire. Does anyone know where Babylon is today? And which is the city of Babylon? Baghdad is Babylon. The river Euphrates went right through downtown Baghdad. And when you go to Baghdad today, some, maybe somebody who's worn the uniform has actually been there and knows what I'm talking about. The ruins of ancient Babylon are still right there outside of the city. And they protect them. Even a war knows better than to hurt such sacred ruins of a long ago empire of greatness. Led by Nebuchadnezzar, who had an ingenious method of conquering a nation. He would destroy the country and the people, chop down trees. Even the dog got killed. I mean, that was pretty rough. And he would bring back representatives of the royal family. Only good-looking young men from the royal family would be brought to Babylon, which means, obviously, I would have been killed on the first night of the invasion. Because <laughs> if 
you have to be good looking. I haven't scored on that, on that one yet, but uh, my wife loves me anyway. And that's enough for me. <laughs> and when Jerusalem was destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar knew what he was doing. As you see, King Solomon had put away tons of gold. Tons of gold and tons of silver and probably tons of jewels. One of the wisest men that ever lived, Solomon, as part of his diplomacy, would trade with other countries. And it was incredible just how much wealth he had amassed. When King Hezekiah, after him, uh, became careless and showed all these riches to Babylonian ambassadors, they never forgot, the Bible says, what they saw. So Nebuchadnezzar, as he was securing Jerusalem, first destroyed the, 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 the treasuries and took all the money that was there. The sacking of the great city of Jerusalem was horrifying as the glorious temple that Solomon had dedicated to God was methodically dismantled and the great cedars of Lebanon that lined its walls and were plated with gold, the gold was scraped off the wood and the wood was thrown into the fire as what was once the great temple of Solomon was nothing but a heap of destruction and tears. The few survivors that remained were sent up to Samaria and four guys from the royal family were captured and their names were changed to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not Abednego. Abednego. I know you're excited. I know you've always wanted to know that. This has really impacted your life. These four young men, and we're told in chapter 1, were God blesses his people. Whoever experiences God becomes somebody who shares him with somebody else. And people have the mistaken notion that the only way to share God is with your mouth. Isn't that awful? Not everybody has the gift of mouth. Others never use it. In my sophomore year, I was voted the shyest student in the school. I know you believe me. I was. I was extremely introverted and timid. I witnessed my first homicide when I was eight years old. I grew up with death. I was afraid of life and those who lived in it. People that I care about have been killed and, and, and people, others that I love are locked up in prison forever and, 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 and then society calls our fam, my family scum and, and, and wants more sentences for my relatives and, and wants death penalties for the people that I love. So I became timid. I was extremely shy. So when I met Jesus, I didn't know how to share him because my mouth didn't work. Now you can't shut me up. Huh? It's, stuff happens. That's right. Check him out. You see, in chapter 1, these young men were faithful. The king says, you're going to eat from my table. All of these royal young men from the different countries that have been conquered, you're going to eat the food from the king's own table. You're going to attend the Babylonian universities, and you will become the advisors and counselors and, and soothsayers and astrologers and musicians to the king of Babylon. He was very smart. Representatives of all the royal families of the countries that he conquered are going to advise him on how to manage everything. Very smart. And these kids, when they got in there, these four, noticed what the king ate. It was bizarre stuff. It made weird noises. Some of it was still alive. It was weird. But because the king liked it, and it was still moving, try one. They're very high in protein. These kids, now here, remember, God wants to reach Nebuchadnezzar. And the kids tell the king, O king, live forever. By the way, that was the greeting you gave the king. O king, live forever. It's kind of like when you greet the president of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. He may tell you you're ugly. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. <laughs> After you, you leave, thank you, Mr. President. You never say yes, sir, unless you are wearing a uniform. You may say, sir, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. You're always thanking him. Even if you have nothing to thank him, thank you, Mr. President. You may not even like him. Thank you, Mr. President. How did you greet the king, Nebuchadnezzar? O king, 
Live forever. You just, that's the, even if you <laughs> wish he wouldn't live anymore? Oh, king, live forever. I mean, these kids, all of their families were slaughtered in front of them. Mercilessly. And now they have to live with the guy who killed their family and serve him. And they greet him with, oh, king, live forever. Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we can't eat this stuff. Oh, your church doesn't let you, huh? No. I, I just want to stay healthy. I don't know why. But health seems like a good option. You see, because if your body is healthy, so is your mind. If you are functioning and you're properly oxygenating your brain, then frontal lobe function improves. Then you can reason better. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. You can hear God speak to you more clearly through the Scriptures if your mind is clear. But if you are ill and your mind becomes clouded, how can you comprehend everything? It's much more difficult. So take care of our, your body. We like to eat legumes, they told the king. You know what legumes are? Beans. You know these boys were Mexicans. It's exciting stuff, man. You know this is gospel down in Mexico. They, they, we want to eat beans. Amen. All right, lentils come into it too. Yes, almonds and walnut. But I like the beans part. And we want to drink water. We don't need all these other things you're drinking. The king, through his servant Espinaz, you guys are going to become pale. No, try us out for for 10 days, just check them out for 10 days if our God will not bless us. So for 10 days they ate beans, drank water, then they had bean soup, they had bean curd, bean pie, bean pizza. They sell those at Taco Bell. <laughs> they ate beans. It was a good 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, their faces were brighter than all the other young men. And when Aspenaz saw that, he told the king, the king was impressed. And he says, truly your God is a great God. See, that means the king accepted that it was true that taking care of your health is a wonderful thing. And they went to university. They got grades 10 times higher than everyone else. How do you do that? The highest is 4.0, but Harvard University accepts applicants beginning at 4.1. I've seen eggheads at 4.3. My uh, apologies to the 4.3s here from the University of Oregon at uh, Eugene. That means you got straight A's in all your required courses, and just for fun, you took all these extra kill them courses that are not necessary, and you got an A there as well. What's it like to get 40.0? These guys were freaks of intelligence. The king heard about it. What do you mean? Yeah, they're the kids that eat beans. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they sleep outside. <laughs> The Bible tells incredible stories. Check it out. <laughs> and so, so they, the king says, bring them in. He personally interviews them, and they are wiser. You diff there's a difference between being smart and being wise. Smart people can tell you the least common denominator of 314,000 times 53. But a wise person can tell you, with all the math in the world, Take care of your family. Mm. Wisdom goes further than knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. There's a lot of people who study the Bible and they know a lot of things, but without wisdom, you're nothing. You just know a lot of stuff. That's right. I know this message of Melchizedek to you. Uh, yes. If you don't know it, you won't be saved. Okay, so you have to know something to be saved. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Have you met Jesus? Check him out. You see, these boys were interviewed, and Nebuchadnezzar says, 
Thy God indeed is a great God. See, he accepted. Nebuchadnezzar accepted that this is a great God. And, and he, 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 everything, this is true. He knew it was true. God tried to reach Nebuchadnezzar through what is called in the Bible a health message that you can take care of your body. God first tried to reach him by inviting him to have a healthy body. And he admitted that it was true, but he did not believe. Because when someone believes in something, they do it. You can know everything and even accept it as truth, but if you don't believe, you're not, it's as if you didn't know it anyway. So God tried to reach him in chapter 1. We go to chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar's asleep and he has a nightmare. Have you ever had a nightmare before? See, while you're sleeping, your short-term memory, which is over here, is communicating with your long-term memory, which is over here. And while you're asleep, it's throwing short-term memories to file away, it's sorting them out like you do the laundry. It's sorting them out to put them away in your long-term memory. That's why your dreams are weird. Suddenly you're in the middle of your living room, and the next thing you know you're at the beach and the foam's wetting your toes, and, and then the next moment a lion is chasing you. What's that? It's a dream. Have you noticed when you're running in dreams you can't run fast? And you wish you could, it's like slow motion. You know why you can't run? Because you're in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice how the blankets were <laughs> in the morning? You better be thankful you didn't get up and actually run because some people do have that gift of sleepwalking or running. See, and in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a nightmare and he wakes up in a cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> and he's screaming, and you know, it's 2, 3 in the morning, and the wise men of Babylon, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, the advisors, the musicians, they're all called to the king's bed, but because they were jealous of Daniel and his four, three friends who were so much wiser than them, they didn't even wake them up because they were members of that same group of advisors to the king. So as they slept, these guys said, Oh, king, live forever. What's up? Well, not quite that way, but... The king says, I had this dream. And like all good dreams, you know how it is in the morning, what was wrong with you? I had a dream. He was here with a nightmare. Well, well, what was it? I don't know. I forgot. Isn't it true? See, it's because it never got into your long-term memory. It just crashed somewhere over here. And you had a nightmare. So physiologically, it's not registered, but vividly you woke up in a cold sweat, screaming, punching the wall, running for your life within the blankets and tangled all up. You couldn't even breathe. And then the king says, all right, you guys tell me what I dreamt because I know it's important. See, the Babylonians believed that the gods communicated through dreams just like the Romans did. It must be important. And, and the, the, the soothsayers and the Chaldeans and, the, and, the, and the, all these advisors and musicians and everybody started uh, uh, dancing and putting the bones and the chicken dust and the lizard gizzard and, 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 and nothing happened. Without Jesus, remember this, without Jesus, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And so, 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 uh, oh, king, live forever. I hope we do too. Um, nobody can tell the king what he has dreamed. Only the gods know those. You guys told me you could communicate with the gods. And the king became furious. Kill them, take them, take them home, and take the whole family, destroy the house with the family still in it. Saddam Hussein used to do that. His Air Force general during Desert Storm was plotting to assassinate him, and during one of their bunker meetings downstairs, Saddam Hussein shot his Air Force general. The body was cut in pieces and put into a black plastic bag to the horror of the family was delivered to the, the house of this general. All the relatives were rounded up and put into the house, and then they blew the house up with the family still in it. Some traditions remain. So that's what the king said. Have them cut into pieces and take them home and kill the whole family, destroy the house. And, and then they went and woke up uh, Daniel and his three friends. You better run for your life. I have orders to kill you guys. What happened? And then they got the story. Take us before the king. And Daniel went before the king. And this guy's not even 20 years old yet. He, the old king lived forever. 
can you tell me what I have dreamt? No, O king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he can tell you what you dreamt. Give me 24 hours. And then the king said, you're stalling, man. I know politics, okay? This is Washington, D.C. I've seen this in committee. Well, come on, CNN, and tell them what I know. Give me 24 hours, O king. I will consult with God, and he shall reveal to the king. So that night, poor Daniel had the exact <laughs> same dream. He wakes up in a cold sweat. Hurry, we better get to the king before I forget this too. And they run to the king. Oh, king, live forever. Do you know yet yeah, there's a Lord of God in his, he's revealed secrets. Behold, oh king, you saw a giant statue that reached up into the heavens. Yes. And it had a head of gold, and it had arms and chest of silver. It had thighs of brass, and power for long legs of iron, and then the most bizarre athlete's feet you'd ever seen. The, the iron, the clay, it was weird. It was weird. Then you saw a king, a giant rock that came out of nowhere. <laughs> in a nuclear explosion with you standing there this whole statue came down around you by now he was yes that's what happened <laughs> look at me that's what happened that's what happened and then oh king the rock that had fallen crushed the pieces into powder and the wind blew them away blew the powder away and then the rock grew until it covered the planet yes in all of its detail, that's what I dreamt. This, O king, is the interpretation thereof. You, O king, are that head of gold. Me? The head that controls the whole body? Yes. Gold, the most precious metal? Yes. That's you. Congratulations. But after you, what do you mean after me? My kingdom is forever. Another kingdom is going to destroy you that's inferior, not even as mighty as you like silver is inferior to gold. And then after them, another kingdom inferior to them is going to quickly take them over like brass is inferior to silver. And then this mighty, powerful, destructive kingdom that crushes the world, those legs of iron, will take over for a long time. Then at the end, this bizarre athlete's feet, feet, of iron and clay that just, they keep talking about getting along, but they just don't. Then there will be ten kingdoms they just don't get along until one day God, through that rock, sends His kingdom. He will finish off the human kingdoms and establish His eternal kingdom on the planet. And Nebuchadnezzar said, this is true! Bring me the silver chain! And he declares Daniel prime minister of Babylon. The kid gets up this morning, an advisor. Now he's prime minister. Now he can lead the parade instead of following in the 20th chariot. He's prime minister of Babylon. And the three friends that are standing there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were made governors of the top, largest provinces, the largest states in the union at that time. And the king says, Blessed be the God of Daniel, for he reveals secrets. So he knew it was true. He accepted that God is the God of gods. Prophecy was powerful, but he did not believe. You see, because you can accept these things, and God tried to reach him by a health message. Now God is wanting to reach him by telling him what's going to come through prophecy. And he convinced him this is true, but he didn't believe it. The way you know he didn't believe it is that he didn't live it. If you believe something, do it. Would you wait no? Go do it. Are you married? Do marriage. Love your spouse. Tell me you believe in your home. Well, I believe as long as she understands that I'm in charge. You must believe in your home. Believe. All things are possible to them that believe. 
do it. Don't just admit that it's true. You can know a lot of things and say, this is truth. This, this message of health is true. But if you don't believe and you don't take care of your body, you can say these prophecies are true. But if you don't believe, what good is it? So, oh, then we get to chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar said, what do you mean a head of gold? He went out to the plain of Dura, just south of Baghdad. Today, it's a plain. Dura means hard. It's a very hard plain. And he didn't make a statue with a head of gold. He made a statue of pure gold from head to foot. It was 60 cubits high. A cubit was from my elbow to the tip of my fingers. What's that, about a foot and a half? A little bit less than half a meter for those of you who are in the metric system in your country. That means it's about 90 feet tall. That's a lot of gold. I would love to find that statue in my backyard. Of course, I'd settle for the front yard as well. I wouldn't care which of the two yards as long as I also had the mineral rights to my property. 90 feet of pure gold, and he's gonna show, what do you mean a head of gold that my, that my kingdom's gonna end? What do you mean health? What do you mean prophecy? What is to come? I'm gonna show them. And then everybody noticed the statue. That, that looks like him. Yeah. So he was declaring himself the new God of Babylon, just like the Caesars believed themselves to be God, and most of the people thought them to be a God. Like the pharaohs of Egypt believed themselves to be Ra on earth, the, as the, the brother uh, of, the, of the sun and the moon, God incarnate among humans, and that's why they gr built great pyramids and tombs, so that he can go back to, to his uh, divine presence after death. And, and, and you see, uh, when, when he made this statue, he brought the leaders of all these conquered nations. And, and we know that Daniel wasn't there. He must have been away on official uh, national business when, when Nebuchadnezzar completed this uh, giant statue. And he had a bunch of musicians over here to the side. And he says, all right, when the music plays, 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 you will all bow down, down and worship the new god of Babylon, Babylon, Babylon. Everybody says, it looks like him. Shh, it is him. When they blow the music, get on your face and start worshiping. And if anybody's confused about the instructions, we have some ovens over here. Ovens are usually about this size made for bread. These ovens were 20 or 30 feet tall. If everyone does not want to participate in the worship, we will watch you be cooked. Any questions? It sounds quite clear. All right. And so then they played the music. And as the music played, this humongous congregation of tens of thousands, as if it were a wave of people, dust was rising as folks were actually face down into the puffs of powder 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 and then one of the generals comes up to the king oh king live forever yes general did you not say whoever doesn't worship is going to be thrown into the oven yes i did there's three guys three who aren't worshiping and they looked over there and shadrach meshach and abednego are like this you know They weren't worshiping. Oh, my boys, my wise guys, 10 times wiser than everybody else. Bring them over here. What are you guys doing? You're making me look bad. The king of Babylon only gives instructions one time. You, disobedience is impossible. What, you, what you've done in public and you're the governors of my three largest provinces. Because I love you guys, I give my own kids. I'll give you a break. Uh, let's gonna, we're going to start the song. There's been a confusion. The governors didn't hear the instruction because they were all the way in the back, right? Right? Oh, king, live forever. You know, like, because uh, these were young men. Okay, like, we know what you're, like, you know, like, trying to do. So, like, we can't, like, worship that. What? No, we, we like, we worship God. There's only one. We can't have two today. I mean, it's kind of like weird. <laughs> so we're going to like continue worshiping our God. But if you like get mad, 
and throw us into the fire, that's okay. Because our God can take care of us. And if he chooses not to, O king, live forever, be it known unto you that we will gladly die, if necessary, for our God. And the king could not believe that these kids defied him, grabbed them, tied them up, and they were tied to the point of their hands turning blue. And I want mighty men. Now, these were mighty men were men who were ready to die for the king in suicide missions. And several men came, yes, king, live forever. Give me the order. Take these men. Heat the oven seven times hotter. And so that's a lot of bellows work. And finally, the entire wall, this thick clay wall of those round ovens was glowing bright red like a kiln where you do ceramics, which puts it at approximately 1,800 to 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, which means if you get close, Let's just call it the end of a perfect day. <laughs> and so now mighty men throw them in, and these guys are running with these kids, and they burst into flames. <laughs> they throw them in, and the men die, completely engulfed in flames. The kids land inside the oven. Entire logs had been thrown in, and they were embers this size, but the only way to pound each. They were bright red, and these guys landed. <laughs> and they all kind of like sat up. The ropes, of course, instantly singed off like hair. Are you guys okay? Who else is in here? I'm here too. I'm over here. We're talking from inside the oven. Turkeys have always been inspired by this story, I can imagine. <laughs> We're still alive. You know, the Thanksgiving turkey, he has quite a journey. Anyway, um, don't listen to me, I'm just excited. And so, they're inside the oven, and they stand up. Come on, man. What's going on? I've never held an ember this big before. Look, it's bright red. It's extremely hot. <laughs> Sparks went everywhere. Oh, this is like weird. And our clothes is just fine. And the king tells the general, Oh, general, come here. Did we not cast three men into the oven? And yes, oh, king, live forever. But I see one, two, three, four men walking freely through the flames. Yes, sir, I, I got an A in math. I, I've seen this before. The shock. And the fourth, Nebuchadnezzar says, looks like the Son of God. You see, at your worst, most possible moment, Jesus is there. He doesn't forsake you. When you're making those final arrangements at the mortuary, viewings tonight, you can't believe this has happened. This is a living nightmare. Jesus is there with you. He does not forsake us when we need him most. What did Jesus say to these kids when he walked into the oven? Hey, uh, excuse me. Oh, master, <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> Whoa, you're a, sight, you're a sight for hot eyes. <laughs> I, I don't know what they talked about, but I can't wait to get to heaven and ask. Okay, so what went on in the oven, man? I got to know. I have to know. Can you just see Jesus? I'm so proud of you kids. Come here, son. I'm so proud of you. You guys are taking care of business. You're being faithful. You're being faithful. Even unto death, you're being faithful. And all of a sudden, the king, oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, sons of the Most High God. Wait, a few minutes ago, throw them into the fire. Now, with respect, sons of the Most High God. Can you hear me? And inside the oven, oh, king, live forever. They're the ones that are living forever so far. 
Come on out, I pray thee. Jesus, we got to go, but thanks for coming by. I just see one of them. <laughs> see, when you're from the streets, you think very differently. I know that it may seem irreverent, but you have to know that God reaches everyone. What I'm letting you know is that it doesn't always look the same when God reaches somebody who's not from our culture, from our value system. If you're a farmer and you're in the, in the heart of Manhattan and New York City, you're going to see Jesus reach people in ways that would never ever be seen on a farm. And the same thing is if I bring someone from Manhattan and put them at a farm, they would be freaked out at how God reaches people on farms. So God has his way of reaching people. The king was so impressed that he says, blessed be the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego because they were faithful even at the cost of their lives. Therefore, I make a new law. If anyone speaks badly against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will be cut in pieces. Your house will be destroyed with your whole family in it. He, he accepted that it was true, that that is the only true God. He accepted that he's a mighty God and that he's greater than the king. He accepted everything. This is all true. But he didn't believe. It's possible to know truth and still not believe. It's possible to be called by God and still not believe. God this time trying to reach him through worship. Sometimes God reaches us through health. Other times God reaches us through prophecy. Other times he reaches us through worship. But even if you know it here, it's not enough. Remember when we studied the Ten Commandments, God says, I want to put my laws in your mind, but what? I want to write them where? It's about love. It's about, it's about when you believe something enough to live it. When you love someone enough to give the rest of your life to them. God wants us to believe because all things are possible to them that believe. But if you just know and you never believe, how can you ever experience God? You experience anger and bitterness. There are people who say, I keep all Ten Commandments, and they criticize and destroy others who they claim do not keep the commandments. I keep ten and they are all keeping nine. Not realizing that they're breaking the Ninth Commandment, speaking false witness against their neighbor. An evil, a destructive evil. But they don't believe because they keep doing this sin over and over. I reserve the right to condemn someone. Amen. You have no such right. God calls all of us to repent of our sins. The Ten Commandments are the first four of a love relationship with God. The last six commandments are of a love relationship with people made in the image of God. And if you speak false witness against your neighbor, even the law comes after you. That's called defamation of character. But some people think because they hold a Bible in their hand or some prophetic writing, they can now destroy the faith of another. Shame on such a person. This is why many skeptics say, you see, you Christians don't have your act together. If you're sitting here tonight and you've never believed in God, you see, we come to terms with our journey as Christians. We have moments of what's called revival and awakening where God speaks to us and we realize this journey is an exciting direction to go we can continue to learn each day more and more. It never ends. This journey will last forever. Even when we get to heaven, we're told we will study the love of Jesus. That study will never end. Well, see, Nebuchadnezzar accepted it was all true, but didn't believe. And finally, chapter 4 of, of Daniel. This chapter was written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. He says, And I, Nebuchadnezzar, was asleep upon my bed, and I had this dream, and I saw this giant sequoia redwood just south of Fortuna. See, my parents live in Ukiah. 14 miles from their house is the tallest tree on planet Earth. It's a redwood. They live in the Pomo Reservation in Ukiah. See, our, our, our tribal roots are accepted, and the, the Pomo took us in. If I shave my mustache, oh, look it. He's native. Check it out. Then some Rojas came along, gave us facial hair. Ooh. 
I had this dream, he says, I saw a tree that reached up into the heavens. Animals rested in its shade. And then one day I heard a voice from heaven say, cut down the tree and, and let seven times pass over until he recognized that it is God who gives kingdoms and takes away kingdoms. It is God who can humble the proud. And so then Nebuchadnezzar called Daniel and he says, I had this dream and he remembered it. And, then, and Daniel got really sad. He says, oh, king, live forever. This dream is for your enemies. I could take it, Daniel. When a man tells you I could take it, ladies, is it true? We can never take it. Can't take it. <laughs> That's why they're afraid to tell us. But make sure you tell him anyway, even if he doesn't know how to take it, because we have to know. And so, so Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel, I can take it. He says, oh, king, you are that tree. And God's been trying to reach you. And you insist on not, on not believing. And if you insist that way, God's going to have to honor your desires. He's going to step back. And you're going to taste what life is like without the presence of God. It is a fearful condition. You will experience something horrible. And it won't be God that's punishing you. It's you punishing yourself. And the king was shaken by it because he says 12 months to the day. So for an entire year, he thought about it. He knew it to be true, but he didn't believe because he didn't do it. And so then in chapter 4, all of a sudden he says, one day he comes out onto the porches overlooking the Euphrates River, one of the seven wonders of the world where the hanging gardens of Babylon in the middle of that God-forsaken desert because of the river in his brilliance. He had made this architectural marvel with plants and greenery an oasis in the middle of nowhere. And he said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built with the might of my hand for the glory of my majesty? Is this not? And suddenly Nebuchadnezzar hears a voice, cut down the tree and let seven times pass over it until he recognized it is God who takes kingdoms and gives kingdoms and can humble those who are proud. And at that moment, his sanity left him and, and Nebuchadnezzar had a massive breakdown. Physiologically, he lost his entire capacity for normal function. We are told that he was carried out to a barn and he would eat hay alongside the animals. In the morning, he would be wet with the dew of heaven. Daniel, being the prime minister, knew about the dream and he preserved the kingdom because anybody would have sta staged a coup immediately and grabbed up the kingdom. But Daniel preserved it for the next seven years because Nebuchadnezzar was a wild man kept in a barn for seven years. And then, you see, sometimes God wants to reach us by showing us how we can have a healthy body and He can reason with us through Scripture, through our minds, because our bodies are well, our minds are well, and, and we can accept that it's true, but if we don't believe it, He might try to reach us through prophetic messages and tell us, well, here's what's going to come so that you know what's coming, you can prepare for it, but we can accept that it's true, but if we don't believe it and our lives don't adjust, then He can try to reach us through worship, through the opportunity to praise Him and come into His presence, but if we still don't believe, He just might allow us to experience with the absence of God is like. And then you realize, I've had friends who've been in the fields of battle in Iraq or Afghanistan, in Vietnam, in Korea, members of my family who have bled on battlefields who say, once the bombs were falling, I had three guys in the barracks who were uh, atheists who said they didn't believe in God, but as bombs were falling and our buddies were dying around us, as one of us lost our eardrums, and all of a sudden someone screamed, please, Whoever prays, pray that God will save us this day. All of a sudden, in the absence of God, you're suddenly clear in your thinking. Help me, God. This isn't a moment for my debate or my research or my data. I need you. Look what Nebuchadnezzar says in chapter 4, verses 34 and onward. And at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, uh, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored Him that lives forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion His kingdom from generation to generation. Verse 36, At the same time my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my kingdom my name and honor and brightness returned unto me my counselors and my Lord sought unto me and I was established in my kingdom and excellence and majesty 
was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and His ways judgment, and those who walk in pride. He is able to humble. He finally believed. When you believe, anything's possible. Robstown, Texas, just 11 miles, uh, 12 miles north of Corpus Christi, Texas. The only uh, crop there is cotton to this day. And I mean, it is flat land. If your dog runs away in Robstown, three days later, you can still see him running away. <laughs> there he goes. He's still going that way. I wish he'd turn around and nothing out there. Cotton, cotton, cotton. And after that, you run into more cotton. And the high school baseball team are called the Robstown Cotton Pickers. I know. <laughs> and they were in last place. So they were the laughing stock of Texas. That's a big place to be laughed at. That's a lot of laughter. Everything's bigger in Texas, even the laughs. No, I'm not putting you down. I got most of my family in Texas. I know my own. The Robstown cotton pickers lost most of their games, and to honor them as they would leave, they would egg the school bus, and, <laughs> and with shame, they would leave town after town after their games. Always, always in shame. Finally, the high school gingerly and lovingly let go of their coach, and they brought in a new man to coach the baseball team. He lined up these kids, and then as he stood them up, he said, all right, I'm looking at a team of champions, and two of the kids... <laughs> Okay, you and you, you were laughing. Goodbye. I, I, I didn't, you're off the squad. Goodbye, I don't have a need for you guys. And as they left, we don't want to, you thought it was funny that I said I was looking at a team of champions? Goodbye, you're off the squad. And the other kids, sir, you just took our two top players. Two top players, you're in last place. Okay, now, listen up. I'm looking at a team of champions. And they all stood there. Uh, what's a champion? what you're going to be, son. Lesson number one, you hear me? First, you must believe. First, you must believe. And they said, okay, what does that mean? All right, you'll learn it as you go because these things are learned by experience. We could talk all afternoon. I want you to run five laps. Bat, bat, and they're running with their side. They say, I want to play baseball. I'm not a track star. Okay, just for that, an extra lap for everybody. And then he had them play soccer. Baseball. Uh-uh, I want to work you guys. And he used to be in the Marines. He brought some values to the training. And so these poor kids were worked out like they'd never been worked out before. They came in fourth place that season. The next season, they came in first place. And in the, in, in the locker room, the coach said, first! And they said what? You must believe. So, first! You must believe. First! You must believe. First! You must believe. And then they go out there, <laughs> like if it was a football game, you know, the way he <laughs> with all this adrenaline, and you're a baseball team. Next year, they came in the state championship. Best team in Texas. Then they went to nationals, and they won second place. They lost. The second best high school baseball team in these United States of America. First! You must believe. You see, when you believe, you do something. When you believe in something, you have something to live for. Everything else is talk. Everything else is last place. But when you believe, let me show you some pictures. I, I thought this was just a story. So I went to Robstown, Texas. I've been there twice. And I saw these kids working out in the field. And I was so overwhelmed. Of course, they worried about some dude standing. Okay, may, may we help you? No, you've already helped me. I just came to see with my own eyes. And I want to show you these pictures, if the staff can throw them on there. Um, they're these pictures of, of the high school that, that we took while we were there. And look what they wrote in the dugout. First, you must believe. 
And these kids have done so well. They have become the pride. I mean, they, it's overwhelming to see what these kids have achieved. And then it caught on to the whole school. They had the lowest achievement scores, the highest dropout rate. 60% of the kids would drop out before finishing high school. But if the baseball team can do it, then we can do it in the classroom. And suddenly they're one of the top achieving high schools in the great state of Texas because the students first. They must believe. And so they said athletics plus academics equals excellence because they believe. And the town who used to be ashamed of their cotton pickers, notice what this town of Robstown did. The, notice the letters. That's not a professional sign. These are kids painting what their purpose for living is. And, and, and if you could move it forward and look at these pictures of, of how it looks in the town now. This one photo that really overwhelmed me. The town is proud of their kids. The Robstown cotton pickers. Nobody laughs because it is now the symbol of excellence in the entire state of Texas. I took these pictures. I went to see this with my own eyes. When people believe, miracles happen. God said, for, for He loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. There are people who know Jesus. They know about Jesus. They know about Jesus in the Old Testament. They know about Jesus in the New Testament. They know about Jesus in the world to come. They have a Christology. They know the soteriological implications of sanctification and justification by faith in Jesus. But they've never met Him. First, you must believe. All things are possible to them that believe. If you're a skeptic, I speak to you respectfully tonight. If you say, I don't know what to believe, yes, you do. Trust Him. Experience Him through your body with health. Experience Him through the study of His Word in prophecy. Experience in Him through worship. He can reach your heart too. That's an experience. That's not just a ritual. It's not a duty. It's what you do when you believe. God reached Nebuchadnezzar and He's still reaching people today. He wants to reach you. Check Him out. You see, I have nothing to lose. I've already lost family. If you want my job, you could have it. It doesn't pay much anyway. I'd probably make more money somewhere else. But I'm being faithful because in my brokenness, I still believe. And God blesses anyone who believes. I still suffer. I still go through injustice. I still suffer racism and misunderstanding. I still have the police mark me at the airport. I, I, just once, I'd like to not fit the profile. And no, I won't shave. <laughs> you can have a mustache. Nobody bothers you. And How come I can't have one? They tell me I look like this, I look like that. And it could all be resolved by shaving. This is America, the land of the free. I thought if I want to grow hair, hair out my forehead, that would be allowed too. Obviously, I wouldn't go that far. First... You must believe. Perhaps God has called you. As I sing this song, I want to invite you, those of you who feel that God has called you to believe in something, to believe that possibly it is time to, to look into this issue of baptism in your life, or to believe that, all right, all right, I can sense then that there is a divine presence, that there is a divinity. Are you sure that it is Yeshua? Are you sure that Yeshua is Hamashiach? Are you sure that Jesus truly is the Messiah? Well, come and check him out for yourself. He is my friend. He is my life. He leads you by the hand. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, we're friends forever. I hear His voice calling out my name. I see the light of His word. 
I feel His hand reaching out to my heart and taste the joy of His love. He is my friend. He is my life. He leads me by the hand. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, we're friends forever. He never will leave you He'll always be there He is the one you're looking for He is my friend He is my life He leads me by the hand Oh, taste and see That the Lord is good Yes, we're friends forever. He is my friend. He is my life. He leads me by the hand. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, we're friends forever. friends forever praise the Lord if there's anyone else that God is calling just come on up so we can pray together Come now and let us reason. God is not want, needing us to feel everything. It's not necessary to feel emotional, although some people are emotionally driven. He wants you to actually reason, frontal lobe. If your sins are scarlet, they can be as wool. Have you made mistakes in your life? Do you live with a conscience? He can and does and will forgive you of your sins. There's nothing more powerful than to have a cheek a, a, cl a clean chalkboard in your life. He wants to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Anyone else? I'm just giving you an opportunity before we pray that God is calling you for such a time as this that you too can believe. All things are possible to them that believe. Enough knowledge. You can know truth, but unless you believe, knowledge will not save you. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus, the way. Jesus, the truth. Jesus, the life. This is an experience. It's more than a system of beliefs. You can experience Him through your healthy body. You can experience Him through the study of Scripture. You can experience Him through the worship with God's people. Experience Him. Check Him out for yourself. Praise the Lord for those of you who have come forward in your faithfulness. You must go and you must tell others what you have seen. Jesus says you will be my witnesses. Tell others what you have witnessed God do this day in your life and in the lives of others. Go in peace.